Hi, everyone. I'm Tyler Putman with the Museum of the American Revolution. We're back on another one of our artisan field trips, and today we're actually in eastern Long Island visiting Mitch Yates, a gunsmith. We're here to talk about a really exciting project we're doing to replicate a specific long rifle that exists from the 18th century, or maybe more appropriately, an example of a long rifle made by a man named Johann Christian Erder in Christian Springs, a Moravian settlement in Pennsylvania. So we're here in Mitch's shop to talk about that project and the work of a gunsmith. Hey, Mitch, how are you? Good morning and uh, welcome to the shop. Thanks. Um, I think a lot of people might be really interested to know how someone like you gets into gunsmithing, but also this version of gunsmithing, which is recreating 200, 300 year old firearms. So what's your background? Uh, well, it, it's kind of been a long and, and strange journey uh, to get here. Um, uh, <clears throat> my interest in history probably started with my dad. Um, at an early age, he, he uh, took me to numerous historical trails around the country. It was something that he liked to do in the spring and the fall. Uh, this was during the bicentennial, of course. And uh, about at the age of 14, I, I saw a movie called Jeremiah Johnson, which some of you may have seen with Robert Redford, um, and fell in love with muzzle-loading firearms. And uh, I was fortunate my dad purchased one for me uh, when I was 14 for Christmas, and I started shooting regularly and eventually hunting with it. Um, when I was about 19, uh, I worked on restoring the last standing blacksmith shop here in the town. And uh, when we were finished, this historical society said, hey, if you want to play in the forge, um, feel free. And they gave us a key to the building, myself and a friend. And uh, so I actually started this through blacksmithing and uh, joined a group called Abana through the Northeast Blacksmiths Association and, and studied blacksmithing for a while and started going to things like rendezvous and living history events at that time, kind of selling what I was forging, um, but not real serious at it. Um, I was in the construction trades and, and eventually opened up a, a furniture and cabinet shop for myself. And uh, one day just decided that I, I wanted to build a flintlock rifle. And it was kind of the, the melding of my metalworking skills and my woodworking skills. And, uh, so uh, I was doing that part time. Uh, I, I, I found a, a school down in Bowling Green, Kentucky in the spring put on by the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. And uh, I went down there um, basically to learn engraving. I went for, for one single class and uh, ended up going for about seven years and, and having the opportunity to study under some of the best um, gun makers um, who had Two of them were masters at Williamsburg, uh, Gary Brumfield and Wallace Gussler, and I absolutely loved it. And uh, so uh, I was doing it part time. And then uh, eventually um, my wife suggested that I was having such a good time and uh, I was really kind of tired of, of my other business uh, for various reasons. And she said, well, why don't you do this full time? And so uh, I took a leap uh, with her support, and uh, probably about seven or eight years ago, I, I started uh, doing this full time, and and more recently, I've branched out a little bit more into some silversmithing and some other things. Um, so my my gun making is is probably uh, you know fifty percent of my business, and then the others, the engraving and some of the other stuff is is filled in some of the the blanks. That's an amazing story. I love the idea of um, kind of getting the keys to the castle of the the blacksmith shop. <laughs> 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 um, you know, something that I think is really interesting about gunsmithing, both in the 1700s and today, is how, as you mentioned, it, it's a multimedia trade. And we've talked with, um, you know, hat makers who focus on certain materials. We've talked to a blacksmith who really just does iron work. But gunsmithing, as you mentioned, kind of you have to know how to work with a lot of different materials. So I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how gunsmithing was practiced in 18th century America, say, you know, in the 1770s when um, Erder was producing rifles like this one versus how you practice it today, if there are similarities or differences. Sure. Um, well, it, it, there are 
some differences. Um, obviously, we have advantages today of light, um, so we're able to work longer hours. Um, in the 18th century, uh, the gunsmith was probably one of the top craftsmen in the community. Um, and not only was he important for doing his gun work, but he also did a lot of repair work. And uh, the gunsmith ledgers will show a lot of repairs for, for everybody in the community. Um, in the 18th century, um, much like I do, uh, there were things like locks and barrels and, and uh, gun furniture available for import. It was actually cheaper to buy stuff that was imported from Europe. Um, for me, it sometimes it's cheaper for me to buy pre-made items. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, there were certainly, particularly during the revolution, um, some gunsmiths had to build uh, the ability to make every single part on the firearm. And he was forging the barrels and making the locks because um, certainly during wartime, imports weren't as available. So um, in, in that aspect, um, some gunsmiths in the period were making um, more of, of the actual firearm um, than in other periods. Uh, as far as materials go, um, we're using probably some more steels. In other words, uh, things like the barrel and the, and the locks with the exception of the spring and the, and the hardenable parts were made out of wrought iron. And wrought iron is something that's not really available to us today. Um, there are some that's left over from when it was being made. Um, so predominantly, we have a greater ability for steels. Um, we have a better ability to cast steel. Um, but in that period, they were casting brass. They were casting silver. And so um, material-wise, it's pretty much the same. Um, now, some gunsmiths um, in, in today's times um, will purchase a lot of the parts. Um, I try to make as many of the parts as I can in, in shop um, because that's how I like to work. Um, as far as techniques are concerned, um, you can't, I can't replicate an 18th century item using 21st century machines. And when we go on a shop tour, I do have some machinery here that helps me. Um, but pretty much as far as techniques are concerned, um, I'm using the exact same techniques and tools as an 18th century gunsmith was. Um, I, I have a lathe and, and a milling machine, and I'll use that to make things like screws. Uh, I'll use the milling machine, um, mostly for your accuracy if I'm making locks. Um, but you know, most everything on a, on a rifle is done with hand tools, and, and it's replicating the same, the same processes. Um, the only real exceptions, instead of forging a barrel, I'm purchasing a barrel um, that's been made in a modern machine shop. Uh, and that's really a cost factor. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to have a client that, that can afford a hand forged, hand rifled barrel. Um, so those are really kind of some of the, the differences. I think that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about the fact that despite all of our modern machinery and techniques, we can't actually achieve the same results as hand tools. It would sort of be a visibly different product. Um, maybe that's a good excuse for us to take a, a tour of the, the shop that you're in. Sure. Let me just turn this camera around. Okay. This is my main workbench here. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty much, there's row of chisels up on the top and here's the, the Christian order rifle in its very early stages. And then if I come over here, I have a, a bandsaw and a, and a drill press, which are for woodworking. Um, that is the bandsaw is something that does speed up the process. I have a small metal working lathe and uh, then I have a small milling machine. And if I work my way over here, I have a, a small woodworking lathe, um, which is mostly things like powder horns and things like that. Um, these are some of the uh, 
smaller items that I make, things like buttons and hawk bells and, and things like that. And then the last thing that I have is, is my engraving area. And one of the advantages I do have over 18th century is I work under a microscope now. Um, and that's for some of the smaller silversmithing things. And that's pretty much the shop. Mitch, it strikes me that, you know, there, in this shop, there are so many different tools and kind of stations. Do you think uh, a gunsmith shop or the environment Erder might have been working in, would it have been bigger, smaller, different in any way? The same sort of processes, but what's the scale like? Uh, because the, the shop at Christian Springs had multiple people working in it, it was probably a little bit larger. Um, and uh, we, we know that from the records. We know how many people were in the shop. Uh, if it was a single gunsmith working alone, he probably wasn't working in a space much larger than I am. Um, the exception would be um, I have a small forge outside that I do my forging of butt plates and things like that. They probably would have had a forge outside. You don't want to forge in the same spot um, as, as you are working on the, uh, you know, the guns and things like that because of the finish and stuff. Um, but from most records that I've seen, we have a, a local shop here in the town that I grew up in called the Domini Shop. And they they were clockmakers and, and their collection of tools is at Winterthur. And the clockmaker shop was under the stairs of the house and was in a space about half the size that, that I have here. So um, I think it, it's going to depend on how many people were working in the shop in the period. I'm really glad you mentioned the Domini shop. Uh, you know, one of my favorite books with hammer in hand. And when you visit Winterthur, you can actually look kind of at a cross section of that shop. They've moved the whole thing to that museum in Northern Delaware. It's just like a time capsule, uh, really stunning. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of cool uh, for me particularly because when I was in the cabinet business, I had clients here in town um, who had actual Domini furniture that had been in the family uh, since it was purchased from them. The records of the purchase are in the Domini shop books. Um, so it, it's, it's unfortunate that the Domini shop left East Hampton, uh, but the fact that it was preserved and, and not broken up is, is worth way more than that. It's, it's a wonderful collection. Am I remembering right? I feel like the Dominis did some gun stock work, but I can't remember. We, we believe they did only because there were patterns they were there were actual stock patterns in the collection, and uh, there I've searched for for thirty years now to find a, a signed Domini firearm here in the tech community. Um, we're fortunate; it, we, the community has a strong historical sense, um, so a lot of that stuff has been perverse, preserved. Uh, but I've never been able to find it. So, it, but we do think they did everything from furniture to clock making to blacksmithing. Um, again, they were, you know, some of the finest craftsmen in the community. That's really exciting. Um, thinking about stocks, maybe this is a good chance to orient our viewers. Some of them may be deeply familiar with the work you're doing. Others may, maybe they've just heard lock, stock, and barrel, that there are these kind of <laughs> basic parts. Um, but I wonder if you could show us what you're working on. And also, you know, we've been really lucky to have the support of the Contemporary Long Rifle Association for this project and some really amazing materials donors. So maybe you could talk about the sourcing and, and the early production stage we're at now. Sure. Um, I, I've been honored uh, to be asked to recreate a, a Christian order uh, smooth rifle. And uh, I say smooth rifle because it it's a firearm that was built that looks exactly like a rifle in every aspect, um, with the exception it didn't have rifling in it. And uh, this is a, is a, a firearm that uh, disappeared for a while and has recently shown back up and, and is being caretaken by uh, the, the museum. And I've been honored to be asked to recreate it. And uh, so I went down to the museum and, and took measurements and photographed everything. And um, we also have some people that have donated some materials for this. So I, I, I want to mention them as well when I get to it. Um, but basically what I do is I start out with a large, large block of wood, which hopefully you can see in the, in the photograph. Um, 
And that piece of wood is donated by Dunlop Woodcraft in Virginia. <coughs> I start out with a barrel, and this is a commercially made product. I, I don't make barrels here in the shop. And uh, this barrel was donated by Rice Barrel Company, Jason Snyder, down in North Carolina. And the, and the cool thing about this barrel is it was copied off the dimensions from the original firearm. And when you're recreating a firearm, um, that's one of the most difficult things to do. So Jason was, was very nice of him that it, he took my dimensions that I pulled off the barrel and, and copied the barrel exactly. So we have the stock, we have the barrel, and then we have the lock. And in this instance, um, this particular lock was donated by Jim and Barbie Chambers um, down in North Carolina. And if you look at this particular lock, it's just a big square block. And uh, this is what they call their gun builder's lock. And what it does is it allows me to copy the original lock more closely. Obviously, these firearms were all handmade. Almost every lock in every firearm is different and it's a little different shape. So what I'll do is I'll take, I made a little pattern here um, for the lock. And what I'll end up doing is I'll end up removing um, the material so that the lock is, is shaped uh, like the uh, original. And uh, I'm gonna do a few other modifications so it, it matches more closely. And then, <clears throat> I have a butt plate and trigger guard here. Um, they were cast off patterns taken from original and another original Moravian firearm. And the brass casting is the exact same process as was used in the period. It's a sand casting. They, they make a pattern, um, most likely out of wood. And it's, it's put into a, a very dense sand. And then you pour the molten brass into it. Um, so I'm pretty much starting from the same butt plate and trigger guard as the original. And uh, almost all the other parts I'll make in in-house here. I'll make the triggers and, and the ramrod thimbles and, and um, any of the other metal parts that, that need to be made. Um, and basically the process, just real quickly to get started, is uh, while I was there, I traced the firearm and I have a tracing of the original. Um, and I made myself a paper pattern. And on this paper pattern has all the dimensions. Everything is marked as far as how long the tang is, where the trigger is, and things like that. And I'll use that paper pattern to lay out on the piece of wood. And the reason I do that is, is I want to be able to adjust it so I get proper grains through the wrist. Uh, I want to make sure, obviously, that the blank is big enough to accommodate the barrel and things like that. And then I will draw everything on the piece of wood. And that will end up being kind of like my blueprint to work off of. Um, and uh, locate all the parts. And, and a lot of the final dimensions are then are also determined by the parts. So uh, um, that will actually give me my layout um, for, the, for copying the rifle. Mitch, I can imagine an, uh, a question a lot of people might have understanding the kind of dizzying amount of material and work that goes into it is do you know how many hours it might take you or how many hours it might have taken a gunsmith in colonial America to produce one smooth long rifle? That's really going to depend a lot on how many parts he's making. Um, just to give you a, a kind of a, a rough idea, if he's hand forging and hand rifling the barrel, uh, in today's market, that's worth almost $6,000. So if, if you're purchasing a barrel, obviously in the 18th century, they were purchasing barrels and locks when they could. They were reusing barrels. Um, an average gun, I think, from, from when I first started and was actually trying to keep track of every single hour, a basic gun is probably would start around 200 hours. Um, and then if you're getting into things like a lot of raised carving, you're getting into a lot of fancy engraving, you can easily double that. Um, and, and, and it's really gonna depend on how many of the parts you're making. Um, some people today will buy as many of the parts as they can. Um, and how much decoration is on the gun. That's, that's where you can spend as much time decorating a firearm as you, as you do actually making it, so. One of the most exciting things about our conversation today, I think, is that we're going to visit you again down the road to see some of that 
work, right? So could you tell us a little bit about the decoration that's on Erder's weapons, what we're imagining will go into this replica? Sure. Um, one of the, the really cool things about the, the Christian order gun and, and Christian's guns in particular um, are number one, he signed and dated them. So we know exactly when they were made. We know where they were made, um, which is very important. Um, he was, and, and if you understand the apprentice system where a, a gunsmith would study under a master, and in most cases, the, the, the master would pass on patterns to his, his journeyman and, and to his student. And, and the student's firearms would look like the master's firearms. And Christian order is kind of neat in that his firearms look like his own firearms. And, and they're, they're beautiful. And instead of doing raised carving, like a lot of, of gunsmiths were doing in the period, he did a lot of wire work. And he inlaid both silver and brass wire into his firearms. And, and the decoration was the same basic artwork that was being carved in the firearms at the time, but he was doing it in wire. And so this particular firearm has a, a lot of brass wire um, that was inlaid into the wood. And that is one of the things when, when we come back on the next visit that I'd like to demonstrate, um, because it's one of the, the it's one of the signatures of, of Christian Order's work and, and particularly of this firearm in particular. I think that gives us something to look forward to. And I'll let folks know that we will be back for part two. And um, we are really excited eventually to have this replica firearm in the museum as a way of talking about uh, craft and tools and weaponry, hunting, combat, all the things that long rifles meant in the 18th century. It's going to be really amazing. You can examine original examples of Erder's work in the museum, and then you'll be able to handle this example, see how heavy it was, what it might have felt like, and really get up close with the artistry. So thanks again, Mitch, and we will see you next time. Thank you very much.